something those who are not watching would be interested in as well. Okay, so I'm recording. Um, okay, what I have done is set up a new class in Apple. So if you log in, you'll notice there's a KLA class. You as students, you do not have to do anything for that. What we're doing is we're keeping track of KLA attendance. Um, the folks who came to our uh, pre-conference, our Apple pre-conference, or uh, as, as I see Drita is here in, on my screen, um, she did an assignment because she was sick. So she did an alternate assignment, so she's already got credit for, for that assignment. But basically, it's a way for us to take um, take your attendance at KLA and give you credit for it. Or if you weren't able to make KLA the alternate assignment. For those of you who are here who are consultants, um, and that's what, Gail? I don't see uh, I don't see anybody else other than my folks. Um, if you have somebody doing an alternate exercise uh, and um, you would like them to get credit, please just send their information to me and I'll, I will happily uh, add them in. So that being said, um, we are recording. This will be archived in the YouTube playlist. And with no further ado, I'm going to pass you on to my good friend, Gail Santi, who will uh, uh, take us to further heights. There you go. With collection <laughs> management. Thank you. Um, I am Gail Santi. I'm from the Central Kansas Library System, and I'm really happy to be here with you today. I'm going to try not to talk so fast that we finish in 20 minutes. Um, and hopefully I don't have too much content prepared for you. I'm going to first go over a couple of the documents that I've got in your um, classroom so that you know what my expectations are here. And I'm going to share now and hide you all there and share. It's such a fun tool. Um, so what I've got here, and can't shake your heads if you can see just a big Word document, please. Yes, okay. This is the document that, one of the documents that's in your classroom, and I'm going to move you over here because I want to look at you and not look like I'm staring out the corner. That's a little better. Okay. Um, I have some competencies in here that hopefully by the time you have um, finished the coursework for collection management, you will be familiar with. The um, learning goals for collection management are that you'll understand the basic concepts of the collection cycle. Um, you will know what comprises a really good collection management policy. Um, you'll be able to see if your library is meeting the 2016 public library standards for collection management. That includes percentages for purchasing and for weeding. Um, you'll understand some of the basic principles of um, intellectual freedom and censorship as they apply to collection management. Um, you'll be able to weed your library and to use the crew method for weeding books and the worst method for weeding media. That was a new one for me. I was really glad to see that. Um, hopefully you'll become aware of online resources to help you select library materials. I know that one of the things that I hear most from our new librarians is just tell me what to buy and where to buy it from. And, and I'm going to point you some good resources there. And um, you're going to understand uh, collection policy. The documents that we're going to go through today are the PowerPoint. If we have time, we're going to go on a field trip to um, the State Library and to look at Novelist Plus because a lot of us don't know that there are some really awesome resources there to help us with collection management. And that's a resource that is um, prepaid by all of our tax dollars. I'm learning how to say that instead of saying free because it works better. I'm going to have um, three assignments. The third one, I'm going to consider that optional. The first one is um, finding out, let me just open that and I'll show it to you. Um, assignment one, I can close that and open up this one. The first assignment is um, going to help you figure out if your library meets the 2016 Kansas or standards for Kansas public libraries. There's a little bit of math here. Um, that's not my forte. In fact, I have a t-shirt that says I was told there would be no math and I wear it often. 
Um, but what I'm going to have you do is go to the public library standards that um, were submitted to the state library. Hi, Tracy. Submitted to the state library on behalf of your library last January. And I'm going to have you find on that huge survey your library. And what we're going to look at is does your library annually expend not less than 12% of its total operating expenditures on books? And do you buy any digital content? And um, that's what that's about. It's just, um, just a guideline. And it, really, what I also wanted to have you do was get in there and look at those um, things that you reported because there's some awesome material in there that you should be sharing with your library boards um, to help steer you in the future. And George will talk about that next month when we talk about planning. The second assignment is about collection development. Um, again, about policies. I just did a, an intellectual freedom pre-conference and everything always comes back to policies. Within the classroom, there are a number of samples with um, the key components that you need in there for a collection management policy. What are you going to do with donations? If you weed, what are you going to do with the books? Um, how do you select? Uh, just all kinds of things like that. Um, if you have any questions about any of the um, assignments, please don't hesitate to contact me. You can email me or you can contact me through the classroom. The third assignment, which I'm considering optional, and because I know that this is busy, um, if you have time, it would be awesome if you could respond to two of the questions um, and watch the collection management video. It's the ethics of collection management. This is a long video, but it's really good. Um, one of the things I think that we do is uh, self-censor and we don't even know it. Um, and so this is going to really help you with those sorts of ideas. So there are the documents. I'm going to talk a lot about weeding because um, as a consultant, one of the things that I find when you inherit a library is that perhaps it wasn't weeded recently or maybe even if ever. And it's really hard to get control of your library if your collection is a mess. I was just consulting with a new librarian and I don't think the library has ever been weeded. And she looked around and she just, she was uh, paralyzed because she just didn't know where to start. It's like trying to cook Thanksgiving dinner if the refrigerator is full of moldy leftovers and every dish and pot is dirty on the counter. You want to clean that up and then you can move forward. And, and so I think that weeding is a crucial part of collection management. So I'm going to lose you all and I'm going to show you the slideshow. If you have any questions at any time, please jump right in and ask. Um, I'm here to work for you, and uh, you've got me until 12. So I'm going to start in with that. And I need to actually move this over. Ah, I'm going to have to move you over there. Now bring that down. Now I can see what I'm doing. Okay, here we go. To weed or not to weed? You need to know that I did not invent this information. Um, it was originally from Attack Your Collection with Crew. It was a, a presentation that um, was done in Texas. But I love Attack because that's about what we've got to do, a lot of us here. So the collection cycle is multifold selection and acquisition. So that's library jargon for buying new stuff or choosing what you're going to add in from your donations. Um, next would be to catalog them and add them to your catalog. It might just be attaching barcodes to the bibliographic records. That'll look different in your library. To process them and get them ready for the shelf. Um, to put them in the right place in the shelf. Circulation or sending them out to your patrons. And then weeding is the last process, and then it rolls around again. I think that books 
and things that we circulate in the library, excuse me, should be a lot like dairy products. They, um, they do expire and they start to stink uh, when they've uh, passed their due date. So in a library policy for collection management, there are a number of core components. Um, you should have your library name, um, your legally established library name, the reason for the policy, the purpose of the collection. The purpose of the collection can be as simple as to meet the recreational needs of any town, Kansas. Um, you should also be specific in your purpose of collection on what you do not collect. You may have a local history or a Kansas collection. If it's a local history collection within your larger collection, you should specifically name out which counties that's going to cover. Um, I was just in a library and they insisted it was a local history collection, but they had a lot of things from Missouri and this was North Central Kansas. That had never been spelled out. And so the previous librarian just collected. Um, if you are uh, collecting um, other things that check out in Kansas, we, we are not unique in this, that we have libraries that check out fishing poles, um, power tools, cake pans. Those should be addressed in your policy as well. The next core component is responsibility and authority. And responsibility is who is responsible for collecting. Um, you don't have to name names. It can just be that this is something that the library director is responsible for. If you are in a larger library with more staff, it may be that you have a collection development team and you can list it that way. And that way as your staff comes and goes, the policy is still intact. The authority is your local library board. Um, they're the ones who give you the authority to do that. In your course documents, I've got a lot of different um, samples for you. You should never have to write anything here. Those are as Word documents, so you can copy and paste and uh, add what's going to be good for your library. A critical component in your library collection management policy is weeding, which is also deselection, um, and which items you'll replace. Um, not only what you're going to add, but what you're going to replace and how often you weed. You could say we're going to weed according to the Kansas public, the current Kansas Public Library standards. Again, lots of samples. Other components, what you're going to do with gifts, because sometimes you get um, donations of money and more often you're going to get donations of materials. Um, what are you going to do with those? You certainly should not add everything. Your donations should meet the same standards as the materials you buy. As a consultant, I tell my librarians that you should never add anything to the collection that's a donation that you wouldn't spend money on right now. Um, what I have found in the past is that, um, especially with smaller libraries and smaller towns, we tend to develop a poverty mentality and you know I don't get a lot of money so I have to add everything and you're really doing your community and your patrons a huge disservice if that's what you're operating on. You should also um, have a dis now this sounds fancy a disposable of surplus materials and property. What that really means is that if you get donations that you're not adding to the collection what are you going to do with them? If you have materials that have been purchased and their um, sell-by date, in other words, is up, it's time to weed them or deselect them from your collection, how will you dispose of those? Will you have a book sale? Will you try uh, Better World Books? Will they go to the recycle? It's important to do that because if your library hasn't been weeded in a long time and you need to weed it, um, your uh, community might think you were doing something horrible when you have the disposal of surplus materials section in your collection development policy. You can use that to help exercise um, 
the important work that you're doing, but also to educate your community and especially your library boards. Sometimes we hear librarians say, well, we can't weed, my board won't let me. And that's not the right answer. One of the, um, in fact, the, the last few things might be the most important part in your policy. You should have a reconsideration or a materials challenge um, component in your policy. You should have uh, in the policy a form that your patrons will fill out. It should list what will happen if there is a challenge or a reconsideration and um, what the process will be for that and who is the responsible party along each step of the way. And again, I've got a lot of those listed as documents. If you find something if you're not finding something that's going to work for your library, I really want you to contact me. I want you to be very successful in this course. And, and I'm going to reiterate several times throughout this hour that um, I am here for you. You contact me, you email me, and you will hear back from me. So I think um, that every collection management policy should have the Library Bill of Rights in it as an attachment or an, an appendix um, and the library board should ad, ad, adhere and abide by the library bill of rights if you'll remember back to our um, time at rock spring sandra nelson said that she doesn't think that anyone who does not believe and in promote intellectual freedom should be on the library board that's one of the reasons that we include this in here as librarians it, part of your job is to train trustees and these last few documents are documents they should all be familiar with the freedom to read statement should be in there as well and the freedom to view statement which governs materials and the date of review when the last the document was last reviewed so you may have heard of the 80-20 rule or the Pareto principle. It doesn't apply only to books. If you think about the clothes in your closet, you generally 80% um, of the time wear 20% of the things in there. And it's the same with your collection. Um, you will find that 20% of your books or materials will account for 80% of your collection. And if you Bear this in mind, it will be easier for you to weed. So the crew method, which comes out of Texas, it is the industry gold standard. The crew method stands for continuous review, evaluation, and weeding. And this is how we, um, we look at our collection. Weeding is not something you should do once every five years. It is something that you should do a little bit every week or every month. And that way you don't have this huge, huge job to do. So um, the benefits of weeding are multifold. Um, you will save space. The truth is, is that your shelves should be no more than 85% full and 75% is even better. The five finger rule is this. My hands are big, so my library would need to be weeded more but you should have at least this much empty space on every shelf. If your shelves are packed fuller than that, it's going to be difficult for you to um, reshelve things. It'll be more difficult for you to find the materials that were placed on hold. And it's going to be difficult for your patrons to find things. And what happens is you get what we call a book avalanche. They reach in for one book in the middle and everything falls out. The 85% the full, 75 is better, five finger rule has actually been tested many times. Um, there is, librarianship is a science, library science, and a lot of people, um, academics have time to do these experiments. And the truth is, is that when your shelves are so full, um, your patrons aren't able to choose what's there. More is not better. Weeding will save you time. Um, as we say there, you know, don't clutter your shelves with old things, ugly things, things that are inaccurate. Medical books, law books, those things should be no older than five years old. You wouldn't want your doctor to treat you, oh, I don't think I can reach. Hold on just a gif and I'll show you. Sorry. 
I didn't plan for a show and tell, but it never hurts. So this book, Does AIDS Hurt? Educating Your Children About AIDS, 1992, right here. It's backwards for me. I don't know if you can all see it the right way or not. But um, from 1992, this book needs to be taken out of a library for a number of reasons, but the main reason is you would not want your doctor to treat you for any illness, um, because I think we've made some advancements since 1992. Those things are dangerous to have in your library. There are even more benefits to weeding, appeal. Um, I would be willing to bet that in an almost every single one of your libraries, if you have a new book section, that's where your patrons are going to go first. Yes? Um, in grocery stores, they tuck away the day old or the crashed bin site. Um, they market their collections so everything is pretty and new. Special things are, are highlighted. And that's the, that's the marketing appeal. You can do that with your collection as well. Um, but they're not going to pull out the old stuff. Benefits of weeding, and this is an important one, it will enhance your library's reputation in your community. You will be considered a, a trusted source of material that is current, reliable, and up to date. Um, enhancing your library's reputation means that you will provide information on both sides of an issue. Um, again, I mentioned the victim in poverty mentality. This doesn't really go along with weeding, but it really kind of does. Um, these are words that I've actually heard. If I weed, the library will have nothing. Um, better for you to have uh, just a few good things that get checked out a lot than for you to have shelves packed with um, things that are just sitting there. Tracy, you're shaking your head. What do you say about that? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I agree with that because I've done a lot of that here in the last year and a half for sure. Um, it, and I do have about 75%, I believe. My fiction, my hardback fiction is a little tight, but I just don't have as much space. But everything else is like it should be. Good. And it does make a difference. It makes it look cleaner. I've actually had patrons comment on it. It's easier to find. There's a lot of different reasons, but the clean and just the easy to find to me are the top two. It amazes me constantly, but it proves itself to be true time and time again, that when you weed the library, people say, where did you get all this new stuff? And you've not added a single new thing to the shelves. What also happens is your circulation statistics go up and it makes no sense logically, but it works every time. I don't have enough money to buy new materials. We hear that a lot. Um, so and so donated this and their feelings will be hurt if I don't add it to the collection. You can avoid and take the emotion out of donations entirely if it's in your policy. That's why you want that component of what are you gonna do with donations in the policy. You should not be adding every single thing that comes through the door. It is not free because you may have to cover it, you've got to spend time cataloging it, and you've got to spend time shelving it. Donations are not free. So when you figure out to what to weed, there are some criteria, um, and musty is our um, word to remember there. First off, musty, old books smell. If your library has sort of an old smell, it could be because of the old books in there. What we also find is old carpet can do that too, but musty, is it misleading or inaccurate? The book that I shared on AIDS is both at this point. Is it ugly? Are the pages ripped? Is the cover torn? Have you had to tape the thing back together so many times that it's just falling apart? S is for superseded. You should not have encyclopedias from 1999 anymore. Most of us shouldn't even have any print encyclopedias at all. Um, if it says the, um, the new, the new um, diabetic cookbook, you really want to look at that title because it might be old. Um, new means right now, not 20 years ago. 
A trivial, no longer of interest. Um, I have recently weeded a book on Oksana Bayul, and um, young librarians won't even know who that is at that point anymore. Is it irrelevant? And this is where you really need that, that uh, definition of what you will weed in your library, because you shouldn't be adding things that aren't relevant to your community. And E is for available elsewhere. If you've got a shared catalog in your library region, um, my rule of thumb when I'm talking to my librarians is, uh, and especially with donations, if five other libraries have it and you're a small library, you don't need to add that. You can borrow it from another library. So it's XX Musty. So the first X is the copyright date. Is it more than a certain number of years old or was it, was it printed a certain number of years old? The second X stands for how long it can sit on your shelf without being circulated. And so the, when you're weeding, um, that copyright date is uh, very specific on certain parts of your collection. Um, fiction, it's a little different. But how long will you let something sit on the library shelf before it has circulated? And this XX Musty comes out of the Complete Cruel Manual, and the URL is down here below. Uh oh. Oh, rats. Sorry, gotta go back. Uh, that's the one I want, and slideshow there. Oh, okay, I can do this too. Sorry. There we go. This is taken from the crew manual. And so you can see we've got XX Musty filled in. Um, in the, uh, oh, let's see, the 400s. We look down here on the left and it says these are the 400s, the Dewey classification. So the copyright, the suggested copyright date should not be older than 10 years old and it should not sit on your shelf having not circulated in more than three years, and does it meet musty guidelines? And this is an amazing little slide right here. Um, the PowerPoint is also in the classroom, so you can just select this one and send it out. Um, in the full crew manual, it actually breaks down each Dewey class even further, but I just kind of made this for smaller libraries. You might not have um, books in every single section, but you know, like the, um, the 800s, um, that's for you to decide that's literature. Um, so on the right, if you look over here, they even include fiction. You're going to need to decide at what point you're going to go with the copyright date, except that your fiction, it needs to be checking out. They suggest no more than two years. Graphic novels, one year. And if you think about the target audience, that makes sense. For young adult and juvenile books, kids' books, it says to use the, the adult formulas here, but there are additional criteria. I find this to be really helpful. So, musty is for books and worst is for media. And worst was actually something new for me. Is it worn out? Um, are your audiobooks on CD scratched and worn out? Is the cover terrible? The cover could be replaced if it's still, still checking out. Is it out of date? How often is it used? If it's rarely used, you need to look at it and evaluate whether that needs to stay in your collection. S is, is it supplied elsewhere? Is it available through um, maybe Sunflower eLibrary if you're a part of that consortium or through all the different places that they can get digital content from the state. And is it T is trivial or faddish? So at this point, it's the rare library in Kansas that should still have VHS. And it's the rare library in Kansas who still has audiobooks on cassette. Um, what I'm finding is that when those things go into library book sales, um, nobody buys them. If you didn't know, um, audiobooks, the format, is driven by the automobile industry. So when your materials are no longer in use, when do you weed them? If they haven't circulated three to five years. If you purchased duplicate copies, 
and um, you, it's no longer highly circulating, you may only need to keep one. Volumes in sets and series are tricky. You don't need to keep every single book from Daniel Steele or um, every single book in uh, uh, inspirational fiction or um, anything like that. So Hot Topics, popular more than five years ago, you probably can let go books that may have been politically um, hot uh, two presidential elections ago. You may need more than one book on a single topic. Maybe you don't. Maybe your library doesn't have the space. And again, there I'm hitting on the VHS and audio cassettes. So poor content, when do you weed? If it's outdated and obsolete, these are the areas that specifically you need to be careful of. If you've got a book in your library on um, DOS for seniors or even um, um, Microsoft Works for seniors, those are really out of date. They, they're not there anymore. Um, computers, law, science, space, health, technology, and travel. When we're weeding school libraries and children's libraries, we're particularly looking for, is Pluto still a planet? Um, uh, when man lands on the moon, um, things like that. Outdated popular culture. I've got I've got a little collection over here, but Arlene Dahl, who was uh, a beautiful actress, popular um, in the early 60s, uh, wrote a book, and the title is Always Ask a Man. I would say that that sort of um, thing would no longer be popular and circulating anymore. Inaccurate or false information, that's the AIDS book. Um, repetitious series, if you're part of a shared consortium, um, and you're a small library, you really want to make sure that every single one of your collection dollars goes well. That means that you don't have to buy every single title in a series. See if someone else has them. You can still market the full series. You could put a bookmark up there or a placer, a space saver. One of the best things I ever saw was an empty VHS plastic box, you know, the clear see-through ones, and they gave it a cover like it was a book and put it on the shelf and shelved it and, and it said, find the rest of the series here, just ask us. Um, so self-published or small press titles that are not circulating, especially those you may have added as gifts or donations should be weeded. Appearance to me is obvious, but it's not really to everyone. Worn out, ragged, things that are poorly bound, poorly printed, um, paperbacks, when the paper starts turning yellow, that's the acid is turning and you need to get those out of your library because they will um, uh, ruin other books. Items that are dirty, marked up, smell like smoke. Um, recently now, because of California and Colorado, they're trying to figure out what they know how to get rid of um, tobacco smoke in books, but they don't know how to get rid of marijuana smoke. That's quite a conundrum for them. Um, are they warped, moldy, yellowing, or faded? Is the print too small or are the pictures horrible? Scratch CDs and DVDs, audiobooks with things missing. Excuse me? When we were looking at that great XX musty, when to weed, which part of the collections, there was um, a caveat on children's books, which are so emotionally um, charged, it's hard to weed picture books. I loved that when I was a child. Um, here are some guidelines. Think about boutique. You want a really high quality current selection. They need to be in great condition. If any small child finds a book with a little tiny tear in the corner, they're going to tear it a little bit more because they're curious about that. Um, you want to, uh, again, make sure that every dollar is well spent. If you collect board books, you're going to need to um, plan ahead for purchasing those and replacing them more often. Those probably also should be cleaned every time they come back. Um, your perennial favorites, you may and you will want to replace the worn copies. Um, that's just part of managing a collection. So the young adult 
section is even more important to be ruthless and weed. Remember the chart said graphic novels one year older, get rid of them. Currency is key. Kids might still be reading Goosebumps and they might be reading um, Sweet Valley High, but the covers have changed and they look like today's kids. They're not going to read those Nancy Drews from the 50s. They don't have a connection with that time. They need them to be current. Um, it's okay to purchase paperbacks. Listen on, on young adult, if it's older than five years old and it's not circulating well, get it out. And Gail, we do have a question. Um, yes, please. Cassie wants to know, so the weeded items, they're trash that can be trashed or sh are they sent on to thrift shops? Kathy, you can do a lot of different things with those. I was looking to see if I could see your face over here, and I can't, so I'll have to, I don't want to look at myself anymore, though. <laughs> um, so part of your collection policy, and that's one of the assignments, um, says that you need a disposal component in there. And every library does it a little differently, but the, um, the things that we run across most often are that um, after they're removed from your catalog, you would have them in a book sale. Um, if they're not gone there, you might um, try Better World Books, who um, will provide you with boxes and shipping labels. Um, they have guidelines about what they will accept and not, and some people get back a little bit of money for that. Um, and I can add that to the link, really, if you just Google up Better World Books, you'll find them. Um, some uh, religious organizations will take certain kinds of books and um, pay for the shipping to foreign countries for children. And the last resort is usually recycle. Does that answer your question, Kathy? Yes, she says. Great, great. And there were some uh, comments. Kyle said that he sends all of theirs to the Friends Book Sale unless they're, uh, they're damaged or something. And, and Jeannie says uh, they have a huge Nancy Drew collection, but they haven't been checked out since she got there. So is it okay to get rid of them? And I was like, if they're not being used by your patrons, Yes. Send them on. Yes. It's, it's <laughs> hard, but the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. All um, right, that's it. You're, you're not a museum, and you're not an archive. A library collection, a public library collection, is a living thing. Um, it needs to be tended to. It needs to be fed, burped, diapered, whatever you want to look at it as. But yes, um, everything comes and everything goes. So with weeding, it's important to remember, and this is where we get into that poverty mentality, that anything is not better than nothing, especially with nonfiction. Know what your online resources are and start turning your patrons on to those things now. You don't need to keep a set of encyclopedias because through the databases at the State Library, you've got wonderful resources. It is Better to have an empty shelf than to have books that have bad or unsafe information, medical law in particular. Use the crew guidelines by the Dewey class. That's the, you know, the numbers for all nonfiction. The, when you use those crew guidelines, what they really help do is take the emotion out of it. Um, it is I think for any librarian, difficult to purchase something that you think is going to be great, and three to five years later, it's still maybe checked out once or twice. That's hard on us. Um, so these guidelines help us take the emotion away from these decisions, give us some good guidelines. Oh, is that it? That would be wonderful. Yes, I am going to take you, let me make sure I've got what i got now, next. I am going to take you on a field trip to the State Library. I have right here, and let me just make that bigger. I'm gonna, you're gonna have to look at my collection here, my, my computer, that's what I'm fine with. Okay, at the State Library of Kansas, there are a huge amount of resources available. And I wanted to show you the Novelist Plus. Um, let me also come here. 
I know that um, my regional library system does this, and I believe that others do as well. I know Southeast does. Um, Michael, do you guys have um, novelist select in your um, catalog? We do. Okay. I'm not Michael, but uh, we okay. <laughs> Oops. Even if you don't have novelist select in your catalog, you can go to any of these other systems who have it, like um, CKLS, and you can use these tools for you. So I'm going to take you to see Metro Girl. I know it works because I'm always there. This is the basic catalog here, the basic record. And you've seen down below it just populated some things here. This is the novelist select information. Can you see my mouse moving around? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So this shows you the next books in the series in the order they're to be read. Other series that you might be interested in adding. And um, so if you have all of the books in a certain series, you may be interested in adding a different series or similar titles. And I keep pointing at things. I always, even when I'm on a webinar, I do that. I, I just do. Um, but one of the best things that I think it does here is we have these newsletters. So um, Metro Girl is a mystery. And this is the next reads thing here. This is um, th uh, through a subscription from EBSCO. It's pretty spendy, and I don't expect that any of us here have the money for it. We buy it as a system. And you can subscribe to these as well. So what this does is there are librarians who are making these selections. These are new books that are coming out. And then they're always going to have um, some things with a certain appeal. You can, and you can certainly do this in ours, you can subscribe to all of these different newsletters. So if we look at um, let's look at Christian fiction because that's always really popular. You can see what it's about, which we know. The newsletter comes out bi-monthly and here's the latest issue. It's opening up. These are all the new releases, but then there are other titles that you may have missed. But I know that from our catalog, and I know that you can do this in Southeast as well, you can subscribe to these and they will come right to you in your email. And then this is kind of doing some um, collection selection for you if you don't have time to go out and look at all of those things. It also links you directly to Novelist Plus, and that's where we're going to go right now. So when you come to Novelist Plus, and I have a handy-dandy handout in there um, in the course content, and I tested it last night, so let's hope there was nothing updated and it's all changed, but um, this orange is your home bar here. And um, so if you are wanting to make sure that your library has award winners, you can click on home and browse by, and you can see here that it's got award winners. If you're not working, well, we'll go back and try again. Of course. Let's try again. There we go. So you've got a lot of different awards here for adults, for teens, and for children. I'm going to go in this instance to the Rita Award, which is um, a romance. I can then select the year. And so these are all of the romance authors who won awards in 2017. Now, you may or may not have those in your collection. One of the best things about this that you can do is up over here on the right, you can, um, that's the one I want. Yeah. If you save these as a file, you can go back and see them. But you can also download this list. Um, lots of other great things here. So I'm going to go back to browse by. Um, what am I looking at now? Oh, okay. I'm going to go to home, 
and how do I learn more about a certain genre? One of the things that our patrons think is that we read everything, and some of us do, but we really don't have time to really read everything. There are certain genres that I don't read. I don't read horror. I really don't know very much about it all at all, but it may be historical fiction for you. So if we scroll down on this homepage here, there's a really cool section called Keeping Up. So on Keeping Up, you can browse all of these different sections, romance, sci-fi, westerns, thriller, young adult. I'm going to click on historical fiction here. It's going to tell you a little bit about the genre. It's important to know that it overlaps with westerns, mysteries, and romance. But you can also see here, if I'm going to get up to speed in historical fiction, it's going to let me know a little bit more about it. Um, it's going to give me some key titles in the collection, some key authors, how you might help historical fiction fans find things for themselves to read. You can also, if I go back one, I can, here are titles to try, and over here on the left is Browse New Historical Fiction. Lots and lots and lots of choices here books and audiobooks. There's only one audiobook, but that's okay. This is stuff that's published this year. You can see that November and December are what's going to be coming along. These are great because you can email yourself this list. This is the best one. I'm going to try to do this quick for you. You can also export this list as an Excel file. So you can just copy and paste titles into your preferred book vendor. Okay, that is awesome. I'm going to go back one more. You can also find um, one more. There we go. You can also find popular authors in a genre. And it even there's a poster that you can, can um, put up in your library. I work mostly with small libraries, and I say to them that you don't have to have every single book on this poster to promote this in your library. These are things that people are going to want to interlibrary loan next year. Okay. I'm going to go back to the home page. And this time I'm going to click on especially for, and, oh, Let's see. Yes, this one. Um, lots of different tools to help you become a reader's advisor, book discussion groups, things like that. Okay. Um. <laughs> Here we go. Getting up to speed in. Okay, this is where I want to type this in. So I can type in getting up to speed, and I get all of these different choices. I know nothing about urban fiction, but if I lived in a community where I needed to purchase these items, this is great. I'm going to go to Gentle Reads. So what it's doing is it's telling me what happens in a Gentle Reads book. Why do people like them? Key titles again, and key authors. How do I help them? Now, this is what's awesome. Gentle reads is a genre term. So if you typed in, and I'm going to copy and paste that, and come back to your home page, and I just paste that in, and I search, it's going to give me all sorts of titles to choose from. You can sort these by um, with the newest first, but this is how you can go back. You'll know what's coming up in 2018, and you can also find out what happened this year and some other books that you may want to have. Notice here there's also series and authors. So I'm going to key in um, all about now I'm going to take that out and I'm going to key in all about and here is another way to find things how to find um, 
historical fiction for older kids, or let's look at fantasy fiction for older kids. So again, you've got a really great tool to help you purchase or to learn more about different um, aspects of genres that it may not be within your comfort zone. So what happens in animal fantasy or in fantasy fiction for older kids, there's a lot of different choices here. Common themes and characteristics. Why do kids like it? And of course, here are some popular well-reviewed titles or series within the last five years, except for Harry Potter. So these may be titles that you didn't even know existed. Here we've got the Wings of Fire series by Sutherland. Key authors, how do I help these authors? How do I market them? And then other choices for you to choose as well. So another thing that you can do here, instead of having to go here more often, what you can do, is um, here it is how do I get alerted when there is new content available you can sign up for these newsletters and the book squad is amazing it has lots and lots of um, reviews um, you can sign up for the uh, novelist news which are readers advisors coming to teach you as well I know this was kind of fast and I just really only touched on a very few brief features of Novelist Plus. Um, one of the other awesome how do I's is learn how to use Novelist. Um, you can also print, save, or share any of your searches to help you find other books like I showed you. You can copy and paste titles into Ingram or Baker and Taylor, wherever you like it, uh, wherever you prefer to buy things. Novelist Plus also has audiobooks, best of, and over here on the left, you can sort by fiction or nonfiction and by different age groups as well. Here's where you're going to find the best picture book favorites so far books about friends for kids. Nonfiction also has lots of choices here as well. And I think that's actually all I have for you. I can go over the assignments, but I kind of did that in the beginning. Are there any more questions? Just some comments uh, on yes. the uh, Emily also weeded a bunch of old Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys books and replaced the first 12 since they were kind of moving along. So mm -hmm. really the only thing that's come up, does anybody have any questions? Well, I would, I would speak to Emily first. Um, what you may want to do is put up some, some of, sort of a, a dummy title there that says something like more titles available. Check your catalog or ask your librarian. You can also add shelf talkers, which essentially are a piece of cardstock folded like this. The top goes under the shelves. And here's where you can say, oh, if you like this, you may like this, and it might be a series or a genre or an author. In Novelist Plus, you have all of that information available to you. It's just wonderful. So good job, Emily. It's hard to do. But you're leaving your library in a better place for the next librarian whenever it should come to that. So great for you. Any other comments or questions? No, I have not seen anything come up. So <clears throat> we're only a minute or two early. So uh, right, that worked out right. really nicely. It's always better than late. Exactly. I know I talked very quickly. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'm available for you. Um, I'm going on vacation Thanksgiving week, but I'll still check my emails and things like that. Um, if you have uh, trouble with the collection management assignment on policies, please ask for help. I think that might be the most important part of this because without that policy in place, you're going to have trouble with um, weeding. You're going to have trouble knowing what to do with books that you weed. Your board might not be on board, on board with that. Did you get that horrible pun? Um, you may have book challenges and you don't know what to do with them. And a book challenge can be as formal as someone going through the process to remove an item from your library, or it can be as simple as someone coming in and slapping down a book and say, this is smut, it needs to be out of our library. 
those all need to be dealt with and it does happen they it challenges to books happen in Kansas all the time and the policy is your safety net um, to get you and your board on the same page regarding your collection it's what most people think of when we think of libraries and we want to help you take a really really good care of that and to empower you with some tools for purchasing and knowing what to do with your things once you have them. So again, don't hesitate to contact me. I want to make this a really successful module for you. And um, thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to release you five minutes early. Yay! Yay. <laughs> All righty. Bye, well, thank everybody. You. Thank you so much for that, Gail. We'll um, <clears throat> see you all. Uh, next month, I guess, December is George planning. Uh, doing the planning. So yeah. see you all next month. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Oh, Gail. Yes. Um, you sent out an email this morning about the texting SMS yes. thing. I got uh, something back from George on that. Okay, yes. he did. All right, then yes, I, I he would told you everything I know. Then, so. well, you know, we're looking for the looking for the easy button there, and so sure. we've got it now. <laughs> for us, we you know we we have a lot of dead zones, and we're not sure which um, providers to list in there, and so we thought if we could get yeah. some pre populars that would be awesome. Yeah, he sent it out. That was great. Excellent. Thanks, Robin. No okay, problem. No problem. I'm out. Bye-bye. Right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>